So in today's video, I'm having a conversation with Dr. Trevor Bazit, who's a teaching professor at the University of Victoria in Canada. This is part two of our conversation, and if you haven't already, be sure to check out part one of our conversation, which is over at his channel. He has a great channel that covers a lot of concepts in undergraduate mathematics, and he's an excellent presenter of mathematical concepts and ideas. While you're there, make sure to subscribe to his channel. Okay, let's get into it. And I'm actually glad that you've already talked about it because Anki is something I get a lot of backlash for. Oh, interesting. Um, because Anki is thought of as a rote memorization, and when I when I put forward Anki, people think, well, you don't need to remember things in mathematics, you should just be able to derive it all yourself. Well, remind yes. us what, what exactly Anki is. Of course. So Anki is this space repetition uh, software that is basically flashcards that can be set up in a way that you see them in a prescribed uh, revision pattern. Mm -hmm. So you study it today, it will give it to you tomorrow, then six days, or if you stuff it up, it will bring the revisions closer together. Now, people probably think, what are you going to use flashcards for in mathematics, right? In mathematics, you need to do these calculations. That's right. But you can use it for computations. You can use it to schedule your revision of certain calculations. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. For example, you could have a card that says Green's Theorem, and then you've got to do some time on Green's Theorem for at least one problem. But at least in my case, uh, we're often taught a bunch of concepts, especially in, in research mathematics. You learn thousands of ideas and concepts and theorems and definitions that I personally want to have a thorough understanding of. Mm -hmm. So the way I do it, at least, is I have a, th a system where I'll have a card which says define Kähler manifold. And then what I have to do is I have to actually write the definition. I, I love that. I can't just pretend and do this uh, recognition. It's got to be recollection. I have to thoroughly write it out. It could also be give an example of this. And that's, that's another point as well because, uh, of course, we're... We've mentioned here that we want to get into examples, uh -huh. but you want to actually build a bank. If you want to get good at mathematics, no more examples than everyone else. That was, that was literally the, the advice my PhD advisor gave me. Uh, You're absolutely right. You know, it's, it's interesting. I feel with examples where whenever you learn a new concept, like, I don't know, the definition of a subspace, for example, one of the principal things that you should try and do is just build up this wonderful repertoire of examples. What is a subspace? What is not a subspace? Can you think of the first five examples of things that are and are not subspaces? And that will, that will really help to build up your intuition. And in many ways, the examples create sort of this foundation. It creates the, the way you build up the understanding for any particular field. So I think a, a repository of beautiful examples for every concept is, is absolutely crucial. And, and if you think about it thoroughly, if you think about when you're solving a, a problem, if, you, if I say, give me a smooth function, you think of one function. You mm. do not think of an abstract function. You think of one example. It's either maybe a bump function or an mm -hmm. exponential mm -hmm. and, or maybe one that does this, something like that. Right. Uh, you don't think of all of them at once. Mm. When I think of vector space, I think of a two-dimensional plane. Mm -hmm. That's all I think of. Uh, so what you want to do is actually have examples which show that your initial intuition, maybe you think that all functions do this, come up with an example that doesn't do that so you're aware of where your intuitions are wrong. Mm -hmm. And this is, it. for example, I, I made a video which got some backlash, but <laughs> it's fine. Uh, not, by, not by mathematicians, this was by... Uh, you know, the general YouTube... Oh, the fickle, really the fickle YouTube math audience yeah. of, of, cr yeah. of critics. <laughs> do, do, you, do you get uh, a lot of... Uh, you, you know, it's, or... it's silly. I, I did one video, I was so mad. Have you seen this nonsensical viral math meme, which is just a string of algebraic operations, like 8 divided by 2 parentheses 1 plus 2, or something like this. Okay, yeah, it, yeah. It's just, a, it's just a string. And the, the question is... How literal do you take a left to right order after you do a, an order of operations? And people, depending on how you interpret it, people get two different answers. 
And it's completely silly. I hate how, what it says about mathematics. That's why I made this sort of really tongue-in-cheek video kind of blasting <laughs> the poor sort of notation and the, and the weird sort of attitudes it said. But I have never seen more heat about people who chose one answer or the other depending on how they did, dealt with sort of a, a series of, of operations like this. But I made, the, I made this video which uh, is borrowed from some content in this analysis book that I have by T.W. Corner. Hmm. Um, and it, it's an example of a function with positive derivative. Okay. So f, f prime is greater than zero. Oh, uh, but not increasing. Is this going to be what you're saying? Doesn't, yes. Okay. This one, this one people got very angry on. Mm -hmm. I, I've forgotten how this works. Is it sort of one thing defined over rationals and another over irrationals it's, or something like this? It's entirely defined on the rationals. Uh, no, entirely on the rat. Ah, which you need the yeah. holes to make it work. I gotcha. Okay. Exactly. So all our intuitions are built upon the real numbers. And so I show how wildly they can fail if we go beyond what our intuition I know exactly what you're talking about yeah right which is really interesting and 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 shows the value of of how you can make a sort of uh you have this intuition that positive derivative means increasing and vice versa and then you have to sort of question one second if you're going to make a proof for either of those two directions you have to be very precise about what you're talking about and it leads to lots of interesting conversations to deal with those weird fringe examples like you're talking about and, and this, the example is there to show you what you're assuming when you think of something. Because mm -hmm. often we think that some things are obvious, mm -hmm. and so they therefore should extend to any situation. But that's not necessarily the case. I as totally I, as agree. I show with this example. So um, I, I wanted to jump back very briefly. Um, uh, I, I never gave a response to the... We went from Anki to example, so I was going to give just a quick comment about the Anki part of it, to sort of support that, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Um, because... One pushback I've had about systems like Anki, which are all about having the space retrieval so that you, you remember longer in the long run, which, by the way, is one of the most uh, well-studied effects about the science of learning, is this idea of a forgetting curve, where if you learn something, you quickly start forgetting it, and you need to have sort of a reboost of it to bring it back into your long-term retention. It's very well-studied and a very powerful effect, and Anki is basically trying to leverage that effect. But some people think, well, hold on, why do I even need to memorize facts in the first place? I mean, can't you look them all up? You can look up where the Kahler manifold is. You, you can Google this if you so wish. And so one metaphor that I give that I think is can be helpful to, to appreciate the value of something like Anki, which really means appreciate the value of, of, of being able to have a lot of facts in your long-term retention, is uh, imagine you're a doctor. Almost any medical fact you can Google, or you can look them up, they're, they're readily available if you know exactly what you're looking for. But doctors know thousands and thousands and thousands of basic low-level facts about anatomy and how things work and drug interactions and any number of other things. And that's extremely important for high-level things like making an actual diagnosis to a patient where you're saying this is, this is what's reasonable, this is what's not reasonable, and you build your higher-level understanding out of those lower-level facts. So it's incredibly important to have this large repository that you really have memorized for the long term of lower level facts. And, and that's where a lot of higher level understanding comes from. I, I, can, go, I can go a step further in, in the utility of Anki. It's, it's not just for memorization. It's, for example, I'll, I'll put something in there like a, a theorem. It'll, it'll, you can actually uh, block out certain parts of the statement. So you could have like every you know, smooth function with positive derivative what? And then you'd have increases or something. You'll notice that on, on the short term, this seems pretty rudimentary, but when you're talking about months and years of doing this, you'll come back to a result and you'll, you'll now know different things. And these things will now merge or you'll realize, oh, I didn't understand what I thought I understood because I was learning that card at this stage and now I know where it fails. And so you may need to add details and you'll, you should actually take notes and try to build on cards as opposed to just trying to, um, you want to build a bigger deck as opposed to just answer the, the questions in the cards that you have now. And I mean, I guess as time goes on, the frequency at which these things come up goes down, which makes sense because they, the, as you develop as a mathematician, you keep coming back and want to add things. We, you know, what, what you need at the lower level thing starts to go away, but then higher level concepts have a lot of wrestling with and you want to keep on coming back to them and seeing what's going on. I, I think it's lovely for this kind of application. 
it's been, if you if you decide to do this and you realize that you you do keep getting a certain card wrong, one thing that I uh, recommend and do myself is I actually spend like an hour taking notes on that thing. I really mm. sit down and study it again because I'm obviously not understanding something. Mm-hmm. If I understood it, I'd be able to regurgitate it. So uh, that's that's what I would say with regards to Anki. It is an amazing tool. So perhaps the next thing we should talk about is the idea of persistence. And and this is related to several of the things that we saw back, I think, in the first video. And and persistence in mathematics to me really happens on two different sort of time frames. There's questions that a lot of people think about when I say persistence, like long-term persistence over a course of a semester, over the course of years. How do you keep on persisting in mathematics? But there's also very short-term persistence. I'm in a really long, messy, hard computation or proof, and I'm getting stuck, and I'm getting frustrated, and I'm getting angry about it, and I don't want to sort of proceed. And I definitely noticed for a lot of my students that early on in their mathematics sort of journey, not having persistence of that shorter kind can be really debilitating. Like, you, you start working, but as soon as it gets hard and challenging, you quit, or you move away, or you, you try to find a shortcut, like perhaps maybe I'll try to Google it, or I'll try to go and find a YouTube video, which I, I guess I'd be okay if you ended up on either of our channels. But other than that, I would say you should keep working on your, on your, on your problem a little bit. Um, I mean, what about yourself? Have you found times where, where persistence has, has sort of held you back in your, in your development as a mathematician? In ter- it's it's one hundred percent the most important attribute mm. that I can think of. Mm-hmm. This is uh, every day, especially like you know, I'm working on a problem. Maybe I'm fixing a gap in a proof. The first thing I think about is the only thing that's going to set me aside from everyone else is I stuck with this longer. <laughs> yeah, one thing my supervisor says is he says that if you want to go further than others have gone, you have to run you have to catch up to them and when they get tired you have to keep going that's right and it's a case of like a lot of days you'll be like ah it's not going to work i've got no ideas but if you really want to get to the other side well you need to just keep hitting it you just need to keep hitting the problem uh, approaching it from new directions talking to new people doing these types of things and if you show up every day eventually it gives way that's you right eventually something will happen um <laughs> In terms of short term, sitting with you like you don't want to do it, you don't want to like sit with it. We all have that. That's why coffee exists. That's why <laughs> I down three coffees, and I uh, I I can't do it without two coffees. So that's that's fair. You you know, for myself, I I sometimes find that even acknowledging my own sort of uh, almost the emotional reaction that I have in while working through a math problem is can be kind of cathartic because. For example, I even find myself this. I mean, after so many years as a professor, as, you know, having a PhD, however many years I've done, I'll still sometimes be working on a challenging problem. And every once in a while, a little bit of like anxiety will creep on. Oh, I haven't solved it yet. Like, what's going on here? Like, there's, you know, I should have solved it by this point, right? But acknowledging the way that there's a, that, that is a common kind of experience and acknowledging that you will often find struggles while you're working through a problem, that you'll often find times where you're, you're not succeeding right away, I think can help bolster the motivation to keep on persisting. This can just mean going and taking a break and coming back. It doesn't mean you have to always be working on it consistently until you solve something. But I think starting to be okay with the, the sensation of struggling with something and being able to persist as you go through it is just an important thing to keep thinking about and, and developing as you as you continue on in mathematics. Here's here's some additional motivation. Have you heard of uh, Andrew Huberman's podcast? I don't Are believe so. American? Okay, Andrew Huberman. He's this neuroscientist at Stanford. He's a very very smart guy. He has this uh, podcast every week, which is about an hour and a half long. Mm-hmm. And he talks about the neuroscience of learning, sleep optimization. All these oh, interesting. That, uh, Fascinating. You'd, you'd love it. Mm-hmm. It's one of the best podcasts that's out there at the moment. And he talks about uh, when we learn, especially things like academic uh, skills. Mm-hmm. We don't really start learning until our brain starts to struggle mm. because the mm-hmm. nervous system starts to realize, oh, shit, something's wrong. Mm-hmm. And then it starts to correct it. Mm-hmm. It starts to now, you've now set up the right conditions 
for it to now start working and start realizing, okay, something needs to be corrected, so now the brain is working on your side. If you're passively like in a flow state, kind of feeling good about yourself, you don't get any better. The brain doesn't is not triggered into any form of plasticity. Oh, that's, that's interesting. I really think that's so fascinating. I, I've only sort of just put my the tips of my toes into that kind of sort of cognitive science literature and the effects that it has, but I think there's a wealth of information there that that really can uh, can help us extremely well. That's really cool. Huberman, uh, he's very thorough, a very legitimate scientist, and does a very good job at explaining it to non, uh, non-specialists in the field. 